I am Mariana Pavlovska. I'm chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter College um, at CUNY City University of New York. Uh, welcome to uh, the National Geography Awareness Week. During this week, we make an extra effort to spread around geographic knowledge among students and general public. This knowledge explains relationships between different places and between people and the environment, and does so across space and across scales from global to local. It can be more important today in the times of climate emergency and profound social and economic inequality. And more than ever today, we understand that the vital need to achieve sustainability will not be fulfilled without eliminating social injustices. It has not worked for humanity so far. Only a society that, that seeks to free itself from class, racial, gender, and heteronormative oppression would be able to thrive towards sustainability. We have several events planned for this week uh, that illuminate different challenges to sustainability. They are listed on our departmental website. Today is our first event, and I'm thrilled to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Celeste Winston. Celeste, please wave your hand. So there she is. Hi, Celeste. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I'm excited to note that Dr. Winston uh, earned her PhD from Earth and Environmental Sciences program at CUNY Graduate Center under the mentorship of Ruthie Gilmore. Upon graduation in 2019, she secured a tenure track assistant professor position in geography and urban studies at Temple University. Her dissertation on maroon geographies is an exceptional piece of research. Her cur current work continues to develop a theory of maroon geographies to connect slavery era and present day policing and black abolitionist place making. Dr. Winston has already published several high profile articles, including in the annals of the American Association of Geographers, our top journal. She is currently working on the book, which is just con contracted two weeks ago by Duke University Press. Congratulations. At Temple, Dr. Winston teaches a whole range of courses in black geographies, cities, and digital mapping. In addition, her 2020 public scholarship project um, is titled COVID-19 and CAGES Mapping Project. Uh, today, Dr. Winston will be speaking on the geography of a Black world of freedom. Welcome, Celeste. Before you start, let me just say a few uh, rules. So we are going to record the session until we start Q&A section. Uh, um, Q&A section. Um, please remain muted throughout the lecture and uh, please drop your questions into the chat. So once uh, Celeste is done with her lecture, I will pick up questions from the chat and also invite you to raise hand and to ask your question alive. So we're gonna try to kind of combine those two modes. Um, at this point, the session will no longer be recorded. Um, I also would like to thank Amy Jew, who is running our session on technical side and providing all possible support for that. Thank you, Amy. So now, Dr. Winston, Please take the stage. All right, great. Thank you, Mariana, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for just inviting me to give this talk. It's really great to be back in the CUNY world since this was kind of my, my academic home. Um, and even if we are in the virtual world still, it's nice to see some familiar faces and names. So I am gonna just quickly share my screen hopefully one of the last times i ever have to share my screen since maybe we'll be back in person one day <laughs> um so um what i'll be talking about today um, is a little bit about uh, black geography scholarship which is where i situate my work 
And then I'll share my own framework, um, Mariana mentioned this, of maroon geographies, which is a particular type of black geographies. And throughout I'll be providing examples from my research uh, in historically black communities in Maryland that give us some really important lessons for what it looks like to build a black world of freedom free from uh, racial violence. So, okay. All right, good, no technical difficulties. All right, so since I am back in my intellectual home of CUNY, I wanna start off with an important argument about freedom from my PhD advisor from the Graduate Center, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. So in her work on abolition geography, Gilmore asserts that freedom is a place. It's not just this abstract political horizon, um, but in fact, there are already existing places um, of freedom, and these exist even within a larger context of unfreedom. And so we have to understand that struggles for liberation require spatial work, and again, they exist um, in, our, in our present day geographies. And so building from this argument, my guiding question today is if freedom is a place, what does it look like to create worlds of freedom? And in particular, what does it look like to create black worlds of freedom? And this focus on black worlds of freedom is critical in the context that we work in where blackness is systematically presumed to be aspatial in nature where black people are assumed to not play any significant role in the production of place. And so in pushing back against those kinds of assumptions, what does it then look like to center black geographies as sites of already existing freedom? Even if that freedom might be fleeting at times and or even maybe if that freedom is predicated on complex relations with other structures of unfreedom. And so I wanna spend a little bit of time pondering this with you all before I get into the kind of the core of my talk. So I want to invite you all to just think to yourselves right now, um, a way that anti-Black violence structures our current world. So maybe it's you want to think about environmental racism or policing or incarceration. I want you to think about some kind of structure or geographic process that structures our world right now through anti-Black violence. We'll pause for a couple seconds. And if you want, you can type it in the chat if you're if you want, although I, I don't think I have the capacity to juggle the chat now, but I can look later. All right, so if you have a process um, or a structure in mind, I want you to now try to envision a particular kind of place that already exists in the world that models how to do the work of placemaking that Gilmore describes on this slide here, right? So to imagine a kind of place where people are organized, land is organized and other resources are organized in a way that defies that structure or process of anti-Black violence. All right, so what, for example, is a place where environmental racism isn't the grammar through which a place is structured? Or what's a place where policing isn't the organizing force of social relations? Okay, so pause, I'll pause again briefly. All right, so I want you to ask yourself if the place that you're picturing is a black place. And I ask this because a common impulse in seeking out answers to address anti-Black violence is to look elsewhere outside of Black communities um, for those kinds of answers. And I'll give you an example of this um, from the a current class that I'm teaching. So right now this semester, I'm teaching a graduate seminar on the intersections of environmental injustice um, and carceral geography, so sites of policing and incarceration defined broadly. 
Um, and so during one of the seminar meetings, I asked my students um, to consider how Black and also Indigenous geographies, um, uh, spaces that are targeted by policing, might give us lessons for pushing back against the violence of carceral geographies. And in puzzling together an answer to this question, the class discussion ended up shifting to a focus on Amish communities in Pennsylvania. Um, and the students started talking about ways that Amish people have been able to establish places that are relatively free of police intervention um, and just relatively free of outside influence in general due to their claims on land based in their whiteness and their unique Amish cultural identity. And so now again here, my prompt was, was to consider how black and indigenous geographies might offer lessons for building a world free of violence um, from policing. And no previous class discussions or readings had mentioned Amish country at all. But my students focus on Amish communities here fits within the common sense geographic frameworks through which um, we kind of tend to envision freedom, right? So, and in, in fact, their focus on Amish communities uh, echoes some of the mainstream debates um, and even um, abolitionist debates about policing um, over the past few years where uh, white affluent suburbs have been pointed to as models for police abolition because of the ways that um, the criminal justice system isn't positioned as the kind of only or even primary sometimes solution to crime and harm. Um, and those kinds of alternative suburban strategies um, have their own serious limitations. And so kind of returning to that focus on Black geographies, um, my students in, were able to further reflect and some of the examples that they came up with outside of white geographies were um, from their own histories, for example, growing up in Black neighborhoods in Philadelphia, um, and elsewhere where they were able to recognize that police were not actually taken as a kind of common sense solution to violence um, and harm in their neighborhoods and where community elders and community institutions um, were looked to um, for holding people accountable uh, for harm. And so with that example, I want you to kind of sit with that a little bit today. And I want you to kind of ask yourself, what is the impulse um, for looking outside of, of Black worlds to kind of animate freedom struggles? And what are the possibilities when we actually look to Black geographies um, for the kind of wealth of lessons that they have for organizing a world of freedom from racial violence? So, um, so as an answer to those questions in my work, I look towards Black geographies. Um, so Black geography scholarship, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, I like to think of as having two major interventions. The first is that it examines the reverberations of transatlantic slavery in our current world order. And so Black geography scholarships will point to, or scholars will point towards slavery era uh, geographies like of the slave ship, the auction block, um, and the plantation, and show how the violence, the racial violence of those slavery era geographies are reproduced in the present day through sites of policing and imprisonment, immigrant detention, environmental racism, and other forms of systematic racial violence. So that's the first intervention. Um, and then the second key intervention of Black geography scholarship is the acknowledgement of the important Black spatial acts of struggle and survival that exist both alongside and against those ongoing geographies of anti-Black violence that are rooted in slavery. And so as an example of these kinds of Black struggles against dominant geographies, the phenomenon of marinage, which is the practice of flight from slavery, is now the focus of a growing body of geographic scholarship. And it's where my work um, on maroon geographies fits in. 
So marinage, again, the practice of flight from slavery was practiced throughout the Americas from the emergence of slavery. And it ranged from individual short-term escape from slavery all the way to long-term collective society building beyond slavery. And so within Black geography scholarship, much of the emerging work on marinage seeks not only to locate marinage in the spatial and temporal spaces of slavery, but to stretch the concept of marinage to understand ongoing forms of racial liberation struggles um, today. And so through maroon geographies, we have this analytical lens um, and a language really for understanding how practices of escape are ongoing, they weren't fleeting, um, and they are inherently geographic in nature. They are really about a project of placemaking. <laughs> struggling to keep switching my slides. All right, so as a way to structure my own and future scholarship on marinage and geography, I developed a framework of maroon geographies, these sites of, again, historical and ongoing black flight from and placemaking, really important, that aspect of placemaking beyond racial violence. And so as an answer to the question that I posed at the beginning of this talk, what does it look like to create black worlds of freedom? The four elements that I outline as comprising maroon geographies offer us some ways to think about the kind of processes that go into creating a black world of freedom. So in terms of maroon geographies, um, the first element that I want to talk about today is how um, maroons, both past and present, have reworked undesirable land to create worlds of freedom. I'll also talk about how maroons reject dominant political economic uh, geographies and develop their own cooperative forms of community. I'll also talk about uh, this concept of fugitive infrastructure, um, which is a structure that organizes and sustains life in contexts of seeming impossibility. And then I will conclude by talking about some of the kind of contradictory spatial strategies of entanglement with structures of unfreedom um, that are equally a part of maroon geographies and that give us a way to think about how we might grapple with uh, freedom struggles when the path to, to freedom isn't super clear cut. So now I'm gonna talk about each of these four elements in turn and give some examples from my research as we go through each of them. Um, and to ground us, I want to, to oops, skipped over this. All right, to ground us, I want to talk about the, the place where my examples come from. So uh, again, I did this research in historically black communities in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is situated along the northwestern border of Washington, DC. And this county highlighted here in dark blue is the site of about 40 um, historical black communities that either have direct ties to marinage or that were established in the decades after emancipation by formerly enslaved black people. And the reason why Montgomery County um, became such an important site of marinage is that during the Civil War, uh, Maryland was a border state uh, between the Confederacy to its south and the free states of the Union to its north. Um, and at the time of the Civil War, the Black population was almost evenly divided um, at a certain point between free Black people and enslaved Black people. Um, and then Maryland itself also became a final destination in many Black people's flights to freedom uh, when the state abolished slavery in November 1864, which was over a year before the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified to officially abolish slavery across the United States. Um, and so within this kind of context of the possibility of freedom, this is when Black people began establishing their own communities. And the over 40 Black communities that were established in Montgomery County 
um, were established between the late 1700s and the late 1800s. And my research focuses in on seven of these Black communities. Um, and so here in these communities, I conducted archival research and local archives and interviewed residents, both current and former residents, uh, about past and present Black life. And through this work, I was seeking to draw ties between historical understandings and practices of Black freedom that were rooted in marinage and present day definitions and practices of freedom. And so diving into these communities, I wanna first uh, talk about that first element of maroon geographies, this reworking of, of undesirable land to create worlds of freedom. So I'm gonna kind of shift a little bit back and forth between thinking about maroon geographies in a historical sense and then pulling on examples from Montgomery County um, to highlight more uh, recent examples, you know, examples still in history, but more recently to explain how these elements kind of materialize in the built geography of Montgomery County. So in terms of this first element, we can think about this reworking of geographic refuse um, in a historical sense by looking to the kinds of spaces that maroon geographies developed. So the kind of places um, where this happened were swamps and mountains, tall grasslands and other kinds of terrain that was difficult to navigate and thus difficult for transformation by slave labor and therefore um, really untenable for inclusion within the plantation economy. And so this kind of land was deemed to be worthless waste according to the logics of exchange value during slavery, even though the land had long been invaluable to indigenous people who had been caring and living on this land and, and using it um, for its resources. And so likewise for black people um, in their flights from slavery, um, they saw this land as a critical basis of freedom. And so the background image of this slide comes uh, from the Great Dismal Swamp, which is um, the, probably the most well-known site of kind of geographic difficulty in which marinage took place in the United States. Um, so here, um, Black people, uh, like they did throughout the Americas, took advantage of the kind of land that was subsumed into Western notions of wilderness as this premise of freedom. And applied to the post-slavery era, if we look towards Montgomery County, um, and we're just look towards, you know, think about our knowledge of kind of abandoned Black uh, neighborhoods, we can understand that the kinds of geographic refuse um, might be different, but the kinds of premise uh, or the kind of premise of freedom still remains um, within these sites of geographic refuse. Um, so today, um, you know, we can look to sites of white flight, deindustrialization, uh, environmental hazards, um, and see that something else is taking place there, right? It's not just abandonment. Um, it's not just geographic refuse. There are all kinds of freedom that are created within these sites. So in Montgomery County, what this has looked like um, over time has been Black residents um, building land, uh, building communities on land that was deemed unfit for living and farming by the surrounding white community. Um, and today, um, these communities, many of them remain really strong and rooted in the history of some of the institutions that they developed, like churches and schools and benefit societies um, that, again, were predicated upon um, the kind of ways that, that their land was marginalized and pushed outside of the, the white spatial imaginary of productive land. Um, and so the kinds of worlds that they built, that Black residents built in Montgomery County, right, were, um, were also kind of rooted in the kind of geographic difficulty that past marinage um, has, has shown to, to kind of make a way for. Um, and then today, the kinds of 
the land is still, still used and still reflects those early Black freedom struggles. So related to the kinds of the Black worlds or the kind of self-sufficient places that were created um, on that geographically difficult terrain um, comes the second element of maroon geographies, which is Black cooperative placemaking. So um, I mentioned the kind, some of the kinds of institutions that uh, were built in historically Black communities in Montgomery County. Um, and that forms part of this kind of Black cooperative placemaking. Um, but in the past, um, a way to understand uh, cooperative placemaking for historical Maroons has been um, through land being considered a means um, of sustenance rather than a kind of means of profit and individual ownership. And so in the Great Dismal Swamp, again, I wanna just use that example because this is one of the most studied um, maroon geographies in the United States. Archaeologists have found that groups of maroons purposely isolated themselves from the political economy of slavery um, and the kinds of, of uh, logging industries that, that permeated the swamplands. And they worked to collectively create gardens and build shelters and produce their own their tools and ceramics from locally available swamp materials. And kind of, again, jumping forward in history going and going back to Montgomery County, Maryland, a number of black communities um, were organized around these kinds of collective visions for land. So um, some communities, for example, um, were shown to, and uh, I found to not have um, fences or alleys and other kinds of natural barriers. And often people coming to the neighborhoods would not be able to tell um, who owned which kind of land, which land, which parcels of land. Um, also residents were skeptical of, of the government. And so they um, often didn't follow official procedures for recording and transferring property ownership. Um, I found examples of this across multiple communities. Um, and what this did, you know, it almost sounds like um, something that was unintentional, just a kind of matter of circumstance. But in many ways, we can understand these practices um, as structural flight from the state and from the restrictions of the capitalist land market, because the kinds of ways that residents use their land also reflected their approach to property. So across Black communities in Montgomery County, um, residents uh, practiced subsistence strategies, they raised livestock, they grew um, produce in orchards and in gardens, they bartered their surplus, they helped their neighbors build their own houses, um, and clear their land, preserve meat. Um, and in all of these ways, they were able to subsist within their own communities and separate themselves, establish a sense of autonomy from um, a larger political economy that is rooted in Black exploitation. And so if we kind of delve a little bit deeper into this, um, this idea of Black cooperative placemaking, it's important to recognize that the context um, in which Black cooperative placemaking came to be um, were predicated on Black communities' abandonment and their suppression by the state, right? That kind of abandonment was actually what required Black residents to develop their own livelihoods outside of the register of the dominant political economy. And so while we shouldn't celebrate this kind of neglect, we should also be able to understand it alongside the kinds of entire worlds that Black people create within those contexts of abandonment. And so if we're not just focusing on the ways that Black geographies experience shared oppressions, right, if we're focusing on these kinds of radical acts of care um, and, and structures of care really, that animate these kinds of communities, we're able to look towards the communities themselves as sites of redress for the kinds of harms of abandonment 
um, and suppression by the state and, and non-state actors as well. So I mentioned structure um, a number of times, um, and this feeds in well to the third element of maroon geographies, which is fugitive infrastructure. So when we think about infrastructure, um, some things that might come to mind are railways, oil pipelines, dams, uh, maybe even borders um, and policing systems. And what all of those infrastructures have in common are that they foster life and interhuman connection um, for some people while engineering dispossession and containment for other groups of people. And so what fugitive infrastructures do um, is they push back against dominant infrastructures by seeking to organize and sustain life in ways that don't rely on and don't operate through the kinds of uneven forms of life and connection uh, that dominant infrastructures do. And this term fugitive infrastructure comes from uh, Deborah Cohen, um, who has described them as these structures of survival, um, right, of sustaining life in, in places where survival almost seems impossible. And in the context of maroon geographies, we can think about slavery era geographies like auction blocks, plantations, and slave patrols, right, is doing the kind of work of dominant geographies. And we can also think about maroon geographies themselves as a form of infrastructure. And I really like this kind of laying alongside each other, the idea of fugitivity and infrastructure because the kinds of, of acts and, and practices that undergird fugitive infrastructure are often deemed unlawful, right? The kinds of black, spatial acts of survival and struggle are often deemed unlawful. Um, and that um, labeling of these kinds of survival acts as criminal or as aberrant um, has enabled over time um, a kind of disavowal of the importance um, as well as the endurance of Black freedom struggles. And so, if we think about, again, fugitive infrastructure together, we're able to understand that far from disconnected or isolated um, and, and aberrant, that kinds of acts of Black flight and survival that shaped maroon geographies of the past consolidated back then even into an entire infrastructure. And today, those acts still undergird a whole framework through which we can understand uh, Black reactions to oppressive structures, not as these isolated and individual acts, but as equally structural as the structures that they resist. So an example from Montgomery County here um, is, comes from the community of Toby Town, which is pictured as the background of this slide. And this community um, in the 1970s, I'm going to read a quote here, was known as an isolated, poor community of Blacks living in drafty, overcrowded shacks on a single dirt street within sight of rich horse farms and rolling estates in Potomac, one of the wealthiest sections of Montgomery County. So Toby Town, again, is this kind of site of geographic refuse um, and abandonment. Uh, it lacked a trash collection service through the mid 1960s um, up until the 70s, just one dirt street ran through the neighborhood. Um, most of the community lacked plumbing uh, and electricity. And the neighborhood was also isolated from public transit access, which limited residents ability to secure stable employment. Um, with livable wages. And so, again, as I mentioned on the previous uh, slide, while we shouldn't celebrate the kind of abandonment that structured Toby Town, we also need to look and understand how residents um, transform these kinds of geographies of abandonment into usable infrastructures 
So the way that worked in Toby Town, um, for example, was residence construction of affordable dwellings that could be called illegal and at times were. Um, these kinds of dwellings were made of cinder blocks, um, wooden packing crates and other recycled materials. Um, and also in a time where many of their homes were condemned by the county, residents continued living in their neighborhoods. Um, they worked together to create a community privy. Um, they fed themselves by raising livestock and hunting small game. They had their own communal garden in which they grew produce. Um, and through all of this, they created a haven for themselves that while on the losing side of uneven development, allow them to win in the struggle to define and practice community on their own terms. And in the 70s, when a federal urban uh, renewal project came to their neighborhood, residents continued to kind of push back against dominant logics of development. Um, so the urban renewal project had um, this uh, provision where it was going to create this this communal garden plot so that residents weren't just um, growing produce throughout the neighborhood, but residents pushed back and they said they were gonna grow their tomatoes and other produce wherever they wanted. They also continued to hunt for food. Um, and they also kind of fought against um, the kinds of, um, the kinds of procedures of coming to own their homes um, that were dictated by the County Housing Commission. And in all of these ways, um, through this kinds of fugitive infrastructure, the Toby Town residents show how Black life might be sustained outside of registers of dispossession and domination that are embedded in development practices and how the, the very acts that are deemed unlawful and the very act of naming acts as unlawful is a very much a part of um, the kinds of of perpetuation and production of dominant geographies. So I now wanna to turn to the final um, feature of maroon geographies that I've outlined. Um, and this includes spatial strategies of entanglement. Um, and I like to end here because what this element um, demonstrates is that the kinds of different elements of maroon geographies that I've already talked about aren't just unconsciously and automatically reproduced um, right within the spaces of struggles for Black freedom, but rather they're constantly um, having to be reinforced and at times they're also contradicted. So um, marinage itself has actually been described as its own kind of um, entanglement with structures of unfreedom um, because historical maroons um, over time um, and systematically have had to leave behind or even turn in other freedom seekers in exchange for their own freedom. And um, this pattern of leaving behind um, is a gendered one. So the majority of those left behind by maroons were enslaved children and the women who bore and raised them. And while women did contribute to marinage by harboring and caring for fugitives from slavery um, and by becoming maroons themselves, um, for many women, their reproductive labor responsibilities posed um, some real challenges to escaping from slavery. And by contrast, men didn't hold the same responsibilities. And they also um, would invite fewer suspicions than women um, by just being outside of plantation boundaries um, because some men were afforded some mobility to travel outside of the plantation for different errands and tasks um, that they were forced to, to take on. And so again, thinking about kind of entanglement with structures of unfreedom, we can understand marinage here as echoing and reinforcing structures of black women's domination even as Maroons work to escape from the very center of those oppressions. And so kind of, again, kind of jumping ahead a little bit in history, um, I wanna talk about an example of a spatial strategy of entanglement 
that comes um, in, into play um, from my research. And I wanna emphasize here the spatial nature of strategies of entanglement. So the kinds of um, complicated relationships with structures of unfreedom are a part of what shapes maroon geographies and the spatial, the way that this happens spatially, um, it kind of comes into being through the ways that maroons, both past and present, figured out ways to use their physical and built environments to adapt to um, systemic constraints at times when they couldn't fully push back against. And so I'm going to talk about an example um, of from, uh, from my research that has to do with police abolition, which was, again, the topic um, of the example that I gave at the beginning of my talk. And then I'll wrap up. Um, for our Q&A. So, um, so the example of, of the strategic entanglement that I want to talk about now comes from the Black community of Lincoln Park in Montgomery County. This community successfully mobilized in 2012 to convert a police substation in their neighborhood into a community-run tutoring and mentoring space for young people. Um, and at the same time that this mobilization was happening, the county was building a $6.4 million new police headquarters in downtown Rockville, Maryland, which is just some miles from Lincoln Park. And it actually was the very opening of this new police headquarters that allowed Lincoln Park residents to convince the police department that it no longer needed the substation in their community. So here we can, if we're thinking about strategic entanglement, we can see kind of two things happening. The first is that the police are benefiting from new investments in infrastructure. And then the second is that black community uh, residents in Lincoln Park are able to take advantage of this moment to combat the intimate policing of their neighborhood. Um, and they are, arguing for and kind of modeling a way to appropriate resources um, from the state for new uses beyond policing. And while this appropriation certainly has its limits, it does um, kind of show us a way, kind of a step towards ultimately building a world of freedom from anti-Black violence. All right, so I want to wrap up. I can talk more about any of the examples, but I wanted to leave a good amount of time um, for discussion. Um, but feel free to ask me uh, more about any of these in the Q&A. But I want to just conclude now uh, by reiterating that maroon geographies and black geographies more generally have their own wealth of lessons for how to structure freedom struggles. Right? Again, the kind of common impulse um, is to look elsewhere outside of Black communities, but we should be looking towards Black geographies to locate ongoing processes of liberation within the long legacy of Black spatial projects that began in flight from slavery. Right? So in the places where marinage defined the early parameters of Black life and placemaking, the practice of holding ground outside of racial violence continues to shape the organization of community and struggles for freedom. And in our work as scholars and, and perhaps organizers as well, um, it's really um, a powerful place to start from recognizing and, and reclaiming these histories and, and, and really locating our visions of freedom within existing geographies so that, that we're not trying to just imagine abstractly what freedom looks like, um, but instead building from the kind of spatial artifacts um, of freedom and taking advantage of the critical tools that we already have um, for, for charting that path towards freedom. So with that, I just wanna point towards um, two of my pieces. Mariana kindly brought these up at the beginning. Um, uh, when she introduced me. Um, you can read more about the framework of maroon geographies that I talked about um, in this first piece, Maroon Geographies and the Annals. Um, and then the second piece is a quite short piece. Um, and there's actually an event tomorrow um, called the Intimate, Intimate Black Geographies of Joy, 
um, that's being organized. Um, I can share more in the chat if you all are interested that talks about kind of how we can look towards really interpersonal black geographies um, for thinking about liberation. So with that, I will I'll stop my share. And thank you all again for listening. I'm excited to talk. Wow. Thank you, Celeste. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Let's give Celeste a round of applause if we can do it with our hands or maybe with um, reactions on the Zoom. That is absolutely um, incisive presentation. I'm sure uh, um, for many um, of those who were listening, that was kind of offering a new way to think about the world around us. So right now, um, we are moving into Q&A section.